Hola, molt bon dia, bons dies a tothom. Eh, avui comencem la quinta, la quinta jornada de trastorns de la comunicació i del llenguatge que enfoquem al peritatge judicial i que li donem marc dins del grau de logopèdia de la Universitat eh, Ubic UCC i la Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. Eh, today we are going to speak in English, so we are very well, you are welcome to the fifth eh, workshop on communication disorders, eh, focusing on forensic examination of the developmental language disorder, and eh, which is related to our speech and uh, ther language therapy program uh, from University, uh, Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. The aim of this workshop uh, on communication disorders is to raise awareness about communication and language disorders during adolescence and early adulthood. More specifically, we will, we will discuss the role of speech language therapies in justice system, which is quite uh, recent and quite innovative and uh, working with young offenders and forensic populations. Why adolescence and early adulthood with language disorders? So developmental language disorder, uh, DLD, and also called a specific language impairment, is characterized by significant and perseverant difficulties in comprehension and or expressive oral language abilities, which impacts on later academic performance, social interactions, quality of life, even job opportunities. This condition can be diagnosed during the first years of infant development, I say can, and it's often intervened during the school years. However, there's less information about how this process of language development impacts through adolescence and early adulthood. So these years, uh, uh, European Day of Speech Language Therapy, uh, the topic uh, was dedicated to uh, speech language therapy across the li lifespan. So I thought it was a good idea to focus on adolescence, which is Quite, quite often um, of light. So, and and more, moreover, recent research has shown that there's higher prevalence of young offenders having language conditions. So that's why we're focusing today on um, forensic examination of DLD uh, in a speech uh, language therapy. Uh, may, I, may I just give you a few um, in, quick information so you can you can write your doubts and concerns or your questions uh, in the chat and my colleagues will uh, transfer these uh, questions so I could uh, will uh, tell uh, this uh, could tell them to our participants to our speakers and today it's my great great pleasure to start our first talk with uh, professor Karen Bryan who will make uh, the opening uh, speech with about uh, speech and language and communication difficulties in young offenders. Professor Karen Bryan works at the York St. John University as a vice ch chancellor. Um, she's qualified as speech language therapy, therapist from the University of Newcastle. And um, her interests are in the communication difficulties in young offenders and in forensic populations. Also, the impact of communication difficulties and access to healthcare. She's involved in the development of registered intermediaries working in the Ministry of Justice and was previously a member of Health Professions Council. So, Professor Karen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
Uh, I'm here in the very rainy north of England, so I hope it's uh, better weather where you are. I'm going to share my screen. We can see your screen now. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to discuss speech language and communication difficulties in young offenders. There is quite a lot of information on the slides, but the slides will be made available later and all of the references are given at the end. So please don't worry about writing it all down. So I'm going to cover um, numbers of adolescents involved in the justice system in the UK. Uh, language development in adolescence. I'll then give a case study, which will hopefully bring uh, this uh, to life for you. And then um, uh, we'll talk about incidents of speech, language and communication difficulties in young offenders. And I'll briefly outline um, some of the studies that are, are trying to establish the value of speech and language therapy uh, for young offenders. So um, you'll notice that the figures are not uh, amazingly up to date and the figures have come from different sources. So it is actually quite difficult to establish how many uh, young people are involved. So uh, back in 2020, 737 children under the age of 18 were in custody. Um, when you include 18 year olds, that goes up to 815. When you include young adults, um, uh, the Ministry of Justice in the UK uses 18 to 20 for that group, then you're up to nearly 6,000. And if you look at uh, community services for uh, young people who are uh, who have offended or who are considered to be at risk of offending, you then see um, you know, 99,000, so a very significant number. We do have to be careful in England and Wales because those services will be working with children who are at risk of offending. So not all of them have actually um, offended. So we can see quite a significant population there. Um, so why do we think there is this link with uh, communication difficulty and education. So there is very, very uh, strong evidence that children who start school uh, with language difficulties are at risk for literacy difficulties, also behavioral problems and psychological problems. And in particular, not being able to understand at the level a child should be understanding at makes it um, difficult for them to uh, take part in education. So they become very vulnerable in relation to education. So I've tried to uh, think about this as um, a compounding risk model. Um, so if I show you on the next slide, what you see is if you have reduced oral language, then you're at risk for literacy, i.e. learning to read and write. Uh, both of those are risks for education. And then once you're not benefiting as you should do from education, then you start to have risks for your mental health and also your behavior. And all of these are risks for offending. So the key risk is the reduced oral language, but you then see these compounding risks, which are all related. So I think that's quite a useful way to sort of understand what's happening uh, in some of these children with developmental language difficulties. And of course, it's particularly going to impact on those who are not receiving intervention or whose problems are not being recognized. Um, and certainly in England and Wales, this is a very significant uh, issue. So many children's language difficulties are not recognized. 
Um, so we do know now that uh, speech language and communication difficulty is a risk factor for offending. This doesn't mean that all children with developmental language difficulties will go on to offend, but it is definitely a risk factor. Um, so Brownlee's and Smart's longitudinal studies um, these are really good quality. They followed children over many years and very convincingly showed that language impairment is a significant risk for offending. And more recent work uh, by Wynne Stanley has also shown that early speech and language therapy intervention decreases that risk. Um, and that's a really, really important study. Similarly, a study by Clegg, which was uh, longitudinal, showed that a third of children with language difficulties will develop mental health problems if their problems are untreated um, and uh, criminal involvement in over half of the cases. Uh, a Danish study showed that boys with severe expressive language problems were significantly more likely to be convicted of sexual offences. That was a small study. Um, but I think it important. And uh, recent work by Hughes et al. has showed that comorbidities uh, with speech, language and communication needs are common in young offenders. So co comorbidities might mean mental health problems, might mean head injury, might mean uh, a diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder. So, um, that shows that um, it's really important to have detailed neurodevelopmental assessments uh, when people are presenting uh, in a complex manner. And you'll see that uh, later in the case study that I'll present. And when we look at populations who are involved with criminal justice, we, we find um, lots of other factors which um, may be making life very hard for these young people. So in England, looked after children, so that means children who are uh, in the care of local authorities or the government are 1% of the population, um, but 63% um, of looked after children in residential care have language impairment. 33% uh, of boys and 61% of girls in custody have a care background. So you can see it's 1% in the population, but 33% for boys, 61% for girls in custody. So those disadvantages around um, being uh, in care um, play out, if you like, in the uh, forensic population. Um, if we look at children who are facing uh, school exclusion, again, 60% of those children, so this would be the final exclusion from school, no, no more schooling, 60% um, of those have significant speech language and communication difficulty. So again, what you see in the population is these compounding risks that are sort of piling up um, for young people who end up uh, incarcerated. And if you look at the educational background uh, in young offender institutes, so these would be custodial settings um, for young people who have offended, have been found by a court to have offended and have been um, sent to a custodial setting for young people. Um, uh, what we see there is 88% of boys, 74% of girls have been excluded from school, 36% uh, of boys and 41% of girls were 14 or younger when they ceased to attend school. Um, in the uh, youth justice service, 25% um, of those who are incarcerated have special educational needs. 46% are recognised as underachieving at school and 29% have difficulty with literacy and numeracy. So again, we see these problems linked to language difficulty over represented. 
So essentially, many of the young people who are incarcerated in England and Wales are not benefiting from what we call the protective effects of education. So if you're in education, you're busy, you have a structured day, you're hopefully learning, but you're also socializing, making friends, developing language through interaction with peers. And also you're not you're not out getting involved with gangs or, or drugs or other things. But these children that we see uh, in forensic settings, uh, many have not been uh, benefiting from the protective effects of education for some years. Um, so in relation to language, adolescence, so the, the period that these this uh, forensic population of young offenders, they're, they're in adolescence still. Um, adolescence is an important stage for language development. And it's relatively recently that we have um, come to realize that language development doesn't cease around sort of 13, 14. It carries on. And I'll show you in a few moments that we also have more recent evidence uh, for brain development, which is supporting this later language acquisition. So through adolescence, um, language is developing in four key areas. Semantic knowledge, which semantics refers to meaning. So semantic knowledge is increasing via direct teaching, uh, via contextual abstraction and vocabulary development. So you're reading, you're learning, you're talking in class. And so your uh, semantic or meaning knowledge is increasing all the time. Your grammatical skills or syntax um, are also increasing. So you have uh, through adolescence, a longer sentence length and increased inter-sentence cohesion. So you can use more complex structures such as embedded sentences, but also um, the inter-sentence cohesion means that you can, um, uh, you can describe something, you can tell a story and it's uh, coherent from sentence to sentence as well as those sentences becoming more complex. So in other words, you can do a lot more with your verbal language. Uh, so it's not surprising that when we look at narratives, again, we see increased coherence. Um, so younger children can give you a narrative, but it might be a little bit, uh, it might lack coherence. It might dot around in the order. Or it might miss things out and slot them in later. You can understand it, but you have to work that bit harder with younger children. And also, very importantly, pragmatic skills. So the ability to use language increases significantly through adolescence. So you become able to understand, for example, sarcasm. That's really quite complicated in terms of both the language use, usage and the cognition. And also you become able to understand, for example, ambiguity, which you might use deliberately in certain situations. For example, if you don't particularly want to answer a question. So very significant development. And much of that development is underpinned by language usage at school. Not, not exclusively, but that is important. Um, so what do you see also uh, alongside acquisition of these, this later adolescent language is significant social development. Um, so refinement of verbal and written skills is essential to life outcomes, such as academic achievement, passing exams, employment, and, not, and in the end, employment gives you financial independence. So these, this later language acquisition is very important. Uh, Adolescent language is also linked to a shift from family-centered to peer-centered priorities. So as a young child, much of your interaction is within the family. With an adolescent, much of the interaction is around friends. Um, 
language development is gradual and subtle and it reflects the shifting demands of, of schooling but also of social life. And research suggests that adolescents with language difficulties are vulnerable to problems with peer and family relationships, but also, not surprisingly, vulnerable to uh, failing to cope with the demands of school. If you're trying to go through school um, with, with all this social development and language development and your language skills are not at the level they should be at, you're clearly disadvantaged. So we do know that this adolescent language development is linked to changes in brain structure and function. Uh, so the grey and white matter in the prefrontal cortex develops throughout adolescence and that part of the brain is associated with skills such as self-control, planning, multitasking, decision-making, self-awareness and social interaction. Um, we get an increase in white matter. White matter wraps around um, uh, the, uh, I've forgotten the name, uh, the, the sort of connections between brain cells. So that speeds up myelination, which uh, facilitates faster transmission between brain cells. So that helps you to be able to... Um, uh, use more complex language, more complex uh, cognition. Also, grey matter increases to puberty and then decreases, and that's thought to um, facilitate using different cognitive strategies. Um, that's a lot to take in, but if you look at this diagram, you can see there the uh, prefrontal cortex here, and then... Um, the temporoparietal sort of junction and temporal pole. And these areas are really the vital areas for expressive language and for comprehension. So we can see that there is key development happening in these focus parts of the brain throughout um, adolescence. Um, and Blakemore talks about these being key areas of development for the social brain, but interestingly, they're also key areas um, for uh, language uh, in the brain. So we've got that nice tie up between um, the disadvantages, if you like, the language difficulties that you see in the offenders, and then what should be happening at school, what should be happening in terms of brain development. Um, so you can see that the picture is quite complex. So if we move on to look at the language skills of young people who offend, um, the studies within custodial settings in the UK consistently show that at least 60% have significant speech, language and communication difficulties. Um, those results come from use of standardized uh, assessments and significant is defined as at least uh, two, uh, two uh, standard deviations below the mean. So we are talking about quite significant uh, language difficulties. This is also supported by international studies. The studies are tricky to compare because they're all relatively small. They use slightly different populations. So for example, in Australia, where a lot of research has been done largely by Pamela Snow, um, they have a much higher threshold for incarceration of young people. So you find more offenders cared for in the community. So that's what I mean about slightly different populations. Um, but the standardized assessments used are fairly similar. Things like British Picture Vocabulary Test and the Test of Adolescent Language. And we find very similar findings. So Snow and Powell um, showed that Australian adolescents on community orders have difficulty understanding narratives and conveying information, largely being at least two years below their peers. And Sanger in the USA showed a very similar picture in her work with female adolescents. 
So we see this quite consistent picture of um, a very high level of uh, speech language and communication difficulties in the offender, young offender population. Um, similarly, Cohen's work in Canada uh, showed that 50% of adolescents receiving services for behavioral disturbances had language impairments when they were specifically tested. Uh, Wynne Stanley more recently has looked at reoffending rates and showed that 60% of a sample of 104 young offenders had developmental language disorders. None of them had been previously diagnosed or received speech and language therapy intervention. Um, and she showed that of those young people with developmental language difficulties, 62% re-offended compared to 25% of the offenders who didn't have language difficulties. The study also showed that the developmental language difficulties were a stronger predictor of re-offending than other factors. Um, so again, this study is showing very clearly that we do need systematic assessment for speech language and communication needs or difficulties in young people who come into contact with criminal justice services and crucially not though not just those who've actually offended and been incarcerated but those who have that earlier contact with usually uh, community services. So if we think about what this means for a young person, it can be very hard for people with communication difficulties to navigate the communication demands of the justice system. So you have specialist language, uh, unfamiliar vocabulary, and also uh, complex legal processes. So for anyone with communication difficulties, that's a particularly challenging uh, context. And there are quite a lot of studies um, recommending um, reducing the language demands. Um, and it's quite sensible, uh, would help. However, a more recent study by Sauerbuchs um, et al has questioned whether actions such as rephrasing language you know, are they really practical within a court setting where um, some language statements, for example, have to be read out in slightly old fashioned, you know, legal language? Um, so some of these recommendations are not really practical or effective. We do have um, in the UK specialist support um, provided by registered intermediaries. Um, these are people who are skilled at assessing and facilitating language and where uh, certain circumstances arise, a registered intermediary will support communication. They don't support the person. They're an officer of the court or they assist the police in an interview. Um, what they do is enable um, the judge, the lawyers, uh, the police officer who's interviewing, enable them to achieve uh, language, um, uh, sorry, achieve communication with the young person. But that's very specialist provision and not always available. So that's an awful lot of information. Let's look at a case study now. Uh, so this is a young offender who we'll call B. Um, so he's in an institution that looks like this, so really very bleak. Um, he's a long way from his family. Um, inside the institution looks like this, uh, locking doors everywhere. So it's quite a bleak environment for a young person to be held in. Um, that's a sort of communal uh, lunch or visit area. Um, so B is aged 16 years and 11 months. He's had a disrupted uh, background, so he does have a family, um, but he has spent periods of time in care. He's also attended 
um, more than one, we thought a number of boarding schools, that's a school where children are in residence for the term. Boarding schools are relatively common in the UK and um, are not in any way linked to sort of justice processes. But sometimes when a child's background is disrupted, them staying in a school, being supported sort of round the clock for the school term uh, can be very beneficial. Um, so he has spent some time in boarding school. We think these were what we call in the UK special schools, i.e. schools for children with particular difficulties, but there's no information available about the schools. He ceased to attend school regularly from age 14 and he passed no exams. So you can see there some of those risk factors that I was talking about in his background. Um, in the Young Offender Institution, he's engaged in education, so he's willing to go, um, but he's finding English really hard, so study of English. Um, and he thinks that this, um, he attributes this to his reading difficulties, which he's always had. So we've got uh, I'll show you in a moment, language difficulties and literacy difficulties. And what tends to happen, he goes to the education unit and then he gets sent back uh, to the wing. The wing is the word used for the residential quarters. He gets sent back for um, sort of low level troublemaking. So for being silly, as a mucking about, that type of thing. He doesn't actually... Uh, you know, he doesn't actually hit people or do anything wrong, but he just becomes a bit unmanageable. And so when something like that happens, being sent back from education, being removed from a class, um, in these institutions, they have a basic level, which is bronze. If you behave yourself, you move up to silver, which gives you some advantages. And everybody wants to be in, on gold level because then you get a television in your cell or your room. Um, he's often on bronze level because of this sort of low level um, uh, behavioral issues that he shows. So when I assessed his language, his verbal ability, he gives you fast bursts of speech. His articulation isn't great. So the two things together mean that some of his utterances are quite difficult to understand. His spoken vocabulary, so that's the word associations test from the Cal 4, uh, meets the criteria for his age. So he uses words that are appropriate for his age. Um, but when you look at formulated sentences, so putting a word into an appropriate sentence, that's the test, he scores at the equivalent of an eight-year-old. So that gives you an indication that he's finding it difficult to use language to convey meaning. And again, when you look at uh, understanding beyond single words, so look at spoken paragraphs, he scores five out of 15. So he understands about a third of the information. And verbal deduction, that's a task where you have to extract um, meaning from uh, a, a sort of two or three sentence a little story, uh, he fails that task. So again, he's okay at single word level, but when you look beyond that, he's got difficulties which show up on these standardized tests. Now, if you talk to him, he is aware of his language difficulties. He will tell you, for example, that he gets stuck on words. He can't always tell people what he needs or wants. He's aware that in a conversation, other people say much more than him. He finds it difficult to talk to staff. Of course, there could be other reasons uh, beyond his language difficulty there. Um, he finds it difficult to think what he wants to say and he has difficulty following routines. However, if you were to say to him, do you have any language difficulties or do you have any communication difficulties? He will say no. 
you have to have a chat with him get him talking and see what he tells you um, this is very common in young people. Um, they don't want to be recognized as having problems. That's seen as a weakness in these sort of uh, environments. Um, but also, we have to be really careful as speech and language therapists about closed verification questions where the required answer is obvious. So are you ill? Do you have a difficulty? you know that the answer should be no. You, you want to be healthy. You don't want to have difficulties. So we have to be very careful about using those questions. And actually, when you look at how young people are assessed, for example, by a psychiatrist, by prison officers, when they come into an institution, there is a lot of use of these closed verif verification questions. And so um, you know, staff will tell you, well, I asked him and he said, no, he didn't have that problem. Same as when you say to young people in England, what age did you leave school? They know they should say 16. So they will always say 16. You have to chat to them about when did you last go to school? And then you find out if you listen carefully, if you scaffold the language. But this issue um, of not wanting to admit to difficulties, of knowing how to answer this type of question, again, contributes to lack of recognition. So when we think about B, he's already struggled at school. Um, he goes through this complex induction process uh, when he comes into the institution, which should help him to cope but it requires him to answer loads of questions, many of which he probably won't understand, and also to complete forms, and he's got literacy difficulties. So how does he try and navigate this? He opts out and he tries to be invisible. He doesn't want to get into trouble because his aim is to join the army when he gets out after a relatively short sentence. So he voluntarily talks to no one. And I, I talked to him about what does he do when communication breaks down? And his response is nothing, forget it. So what you can see there is because of his uh, language difficulties, He's finding it difficult to communicate. He's finding it difficult to navigate the institution. And he's not um, dealing with communication breakdown. So his problems are compounding. So if somebody really gets difficult with him, argues or questions him, it tends to end up in a fight or and fights will end up in an exclusion. So sometimes he's excluded before he gets aggressive, often he gets aggressive. When I uh, spoke to him, he'd recently attended a review board. This is a very significant review. <clears throat> it tells you whether you're on track to leave the institution. Um, it makes clear what you need to do to be in the position to complete your sentence and go. Um, and he had understood one or two bits. So he doesn't really know what's going on with his progress. He's been excluded from some groups and workshops, but he didn't know why. Uh, his comment was that he wasn't fighting. He wanted a job in the garden, but he was refused this because he was too high risk. And when I talked to him, he didn't know what high risk meant and he didn't know why he was considered high risk so really he's not addressing any of his issues and um, at around the time I assessed him 72 percent of young offenders aged uh, 10 to 17 so incarcerated young offenders re-offended within 12 months um, and you know from what we can see of the picture here he's likely to follow that pattern. He's not really addressing any of his issues, which is really, really uh, sad. So what we see, and B 
kind of personifies this is these lost opportunities for identification and remediation of language difficulties. So this young person has been to school and he's been to at least one special school. Um, the reports show long-standing literacy difficulties. He's been in the care system. Um, he's been uh, something in England that's uh, abbreviated to NEAT, which means not in education, employment or training. Uh, so he's been NEAT since around age 14. He's also had contact with a lot of youth justice services in the community, but at no point has his language difficulties uh, been recognised. Um, so we can't just blame these uh, institutions. If you like, they're, they're receiving um, young people whose language difficulties have not been recognised and not been managed. And you heard earlier that early intervention can prevent um, some of these issues. So um, when we also think uh, about adolescence, as well as the language development, adolescence is a crucial period um, for uh, developing uh, your mental health. For most people, you know, positive, um, uh, becoming more resilient, uh, being able to rationalize difficulties, learning to cope, learning to self-manage. Um, so all of that is also happening uh, in mental health, but in, ad in, in, in adolescence, sorry, but in adolescence, language difficulties and mental health problems can be quite difficult to separate. Um, also, many mental health disorders originate in the adolescent period. So um, uh, people who go on to have lifelong problems with depression, uh, schizophrenia, etc., the origins are often in er early adolescence. And we know that this is a crucial period for language development. So it can make language difficulties and mental health problems difficult to separate. So just to give you an example of that, um, if a young person is depressed, then they will not be interacting verbally as would be expected. So is that a language difficulty? Is that a uh, uh, um, difficulty associated with the depression. It can be quite difficult to tell. Um, also, any language difficulties will compromise or make much, much more difficult verbally mediated assessments. That means any assessment that involves me asking questions and you answering. If you have a, a communication difficulty, that assessment is automatically much more difficult for you. And also verbally mediated interventions. So an intervention such as counseling or psychotherapy largely happens through discussion. Um, so again, you're going to be disadvantaged in terms of benefiting from those verbally mediated interventions. Also in the adolescent period, language difficulties are often attributed to other causes. So behavior problems are recognized much more easily, particularly in school environments. Um, but the underlying language difficulties are, are not recognized. So the label becomes behavioral problems rather than language problems. So um, I'll move on now to uh, talking about uh, just a small number of studies that have tried to establish the value of uh, speech and language therapy within youth justice services. So we have something in England called the Intensive Surveillance and Supervision Programme delivered by a youth offending team in the community. So you go into this programme, um, probably you've offended more than once, it will be low level offending, but you've done it several times and you are at a point where unless you make some changes, you are going to go 
uh, next time you offend into a young offender institution. So if you like, this is a very intensive program and it's designed to stop people tipping into uh, the custodial system, which clearly has a lot of disadvantages. So an established uh, program within a youth offending team uh, had for an experimental period, a speech and language therapist three and a half days a week added to the intensive surveillance and supervision program. So what we wanted to do was identify language and communication difficulties in this subpopulation. We wanted to plan and coordinate intervention to address individual communication needs and evaluate any changes in the language skills post intervention. So we screened everybody who came in uh, for, I think it was a 12 month period. We managed to see everybody except three for, for very uh, particular reasons. So we did a brief self-assessment um, and we also asked the key worker to carry out the self-assessment. Self-assessment has some drawbacks, which I'll mention later, but it, it can be useful. We use the CALF for communication observation schedule. And again, uh, so we did it as, uh, well, the therapists did it. I was, uh, I was leading the research project, um, but we also asked the key worker. So that's the person within the program who best knows the young person. Um, you would probably ask a parent or a, a guardian if they were uh, in uh, the, the community. Um, we used the verbal reasoning deduction task and we used um, the Broadmoor observation of communication. Um, so the Broadmoor observation of communication was a, is a set of um, measures um, which was developed um, for uh, people with uh, language difficulties and also uh, significant mental health problems. So um, we identified um, 58 of the 72 young people that we screened um, had a profile suggestive of uh, communication difficulties. That's all we could conclude from this screen. They were aged 11 to 18. Most of them were excluded from school or they were in some kind of alternative program within schools for children recognized as having behavioral, emotional and social difficulties. Um, a number had statements for challenging behavior. To be in that type of special school, they would have a statement of educational need but none had statements for either learning difficulties or language difficulties. So for the 58 identified by the screen, we then did a, a slightly more detailed assessment. So we used some KELF4 subtests, understanding spoken paragraphs, word associations and formulated sentences. And 65% of that group had profiles indicating that they might benefit from speech and language therapy intervention. Um, and we what we saw was that their comprehension delays were the most likely to be unrecognized by the team. So what we did then was to uh, design interventions for uh, the 65% that we had assessed. A few of them were seen directly by the speech and language therapist, but most of them had a program delivered within this very intense program. So we looked at things such as listening and understanding, using language at an appropriate level, um, but also um, supporting memory skills, um, teaching vocabulary and using other strategies to aid understanding. So we would incorporate those into, for example, existing group work. We would also um, use sessions with people like the key workers to work on expressive language, fluency, narrative, clarity of speech, vocabulary, uh, giving instructions. So that was individualized, but 
little of it was actually delivered by the speech and language therapist. There's only one of her and she's only there three and a half days a week. And also we incorporated again into the program um, quite a lot of work on social skills, awareness of good communication, verbal and nonverbal skills, how to be appropriately assertive. Um, so to say what you need to say, but to say it politely and preparation for things like interviews and court appearances. So a lot of the speech and language therapist time was sent was spent on designing programs and training the other staff to deliver. And she did some uh, interventions. And so um, when it came to the reassessment, um, 20 of the 49 who received that additional speech and language therapy intervention within their program were reassessed as they left. Um, so we didn't reassess those who breached their conditions, i.e. they entered custody or they reoffended, or they moved away. So there is probably a positive bias in the sample. Obviously, for practical reasons, we weren't able to get uh, at those people. Um, but we do think that, that it is important to recognize that we were largely uh, reassessing those who'd successfully gone into the program and were leaving that program rather than re-entering custody. Although some of the ones who moved away may have moved away for very positive reasons. And so what we saw was 75% of those reassessed had improved on their language assessment. The other methodological issue here is that there was no control group. Um, <clears throat> ethically, we couldn't have justified not uh, intervening. This was one of the first intervention studies, so it wouldn't really be justified. But it really is important to, uh, to, to be clear on that. Um, the speech and language therapy input was positively viewed by the staff in terms of enabling them to help these young people with language difficulties to understand the offender treatment programs and participate. Um, and also, when we look at the retest result, which is very positive, we can't say it was due to speech and language therapy. We have to be careful to reflect that what we're seeing is the total contribution of the program with the speech and language therapy input added. But we couldn't absolutely say it was the speech and language therapy that caused the language improvement. But it was fantastic that we could demonstrate that um, improvement uh, in 75% of the reassessed group. Um, on the standardized tests. And more recently, Snow and Woodward in Australia have conducted a phase one clinical trial of one-to-one -one speech and language uh, therapy intervention delivered in a custodial setting for young offenders. And their results are really interesting. They showed that the intervention was effective and the young people engaged well. But the trial also illustrated the uh, complexities of conducting research in these environments. So complexities of service delivery, sudden changes in routine that make the research pragmatically really difficult um, to deliver. So clearly we do need more studies on speech and language therapy intervention itself. Uh, so this is my final slide. Um, just to summarize, speech, language and communication problems are common problems um, and they are a risk factor for educational difficulty and involvement in crimin criminal activity and also a risk to mental health. Um, but we do recognize that that risk can be mitigated by uh, speech and language therapy intervention. Increasingly, we recognize the importance of this adolescent language phase and the associated social development and the vulnerability for a person's mental health if this is disrupted. 
Um, we need much greater awareness that speech, language and communication difficulties are often enduring problems. Um, many teachers, doctors, people like that sort of kind of assume that these developmental problems, you, you grow out of them. Um, they, you can reduce the impact substantially with speech and language therapy, but if the problems are not recognized, the remediation doesn't follow. Also, it's very important to be aware when working with these populations that a young person with speech, language and communication difficulty is less likely to benefit from interventions that are verbally mediated. So pretty well everything you do at school, the teacher is talking to you, the teacher is writing on a whiteboard. Um, so all of these interventions, counselling, psychotherapy, they're much more difficult for children with language difficulties. And you see overrepresentation of young people with language difficulties and mental health problems um, in children in uh, settings for uh, emotional and behaviour disorders, in youth justice settings and in services that deal with school exclusion. So we need to routinely screen young people with behaviour problems, with engagement problems or with school problems for communication difficulties, because what we can clearly see and the case study of B showed you very uh, compellingly, I hope, that the despite going through service after service, the communication difficulties are not recognised um, without uh, proper screening. Uh, so thank you very much. I know that was uh, a lot to get through. Um, I'll just leave this slide for a moment and then uh, I'll go back to the normal screen. Are you okay for me to take yes. the presentation yeah, you can take now? That. Okay. Okay, Karen, thank you so much. That was a terrific talk uh, and a uh, great amount of information and very greatly, you know, um, it really helped us to understand which are these, these difficulties and what maybe tracing the next steps, which I don't think in our context in, in Spain, it's pretty, pretty uh, we are not that aware, I think. And I, so while people from the audience are thinking about questions or maybe and any of our speakers uh, are also welcome to raise any question if you want to. I was curious, Karen, when was, when was your fir the first time you approached the forensic population? So when was your first? Um, it was around... Um... Probably, um, I think it was 1998, it shows I'm very elderly. Um, I was, by that time, working as a consultant speech and language therapist in a hospital, um, which is uh, called a high secure hospital. So it was um, for people with very severe and complex uh, mental health disorders who were uh, had either committed very significant crimes or were uh, were judged to be a significant risk to the public and so uh, because of their mental health problems they were being held in a secure hospital rather than a prison i started working there as a consultant speech and language therapist i started a screening program there and um I only worked there one one day every fortnight, um, but I started to gather evidence for language needs in this population. And then the chief inspector of prisons in the UK, um, who had been the uh, leader of the British Army, was very concerned about uh, young people that he was seeing in prison who didn't seem to be able to communicate and he he thought that's strange because I'm used to young people in the army some of whom have you know only had basic education but somehow they're communicating much better um, and he went to a young offender institution in Scotland that was the first 
to have a speech and language therapist and the governor told him that he was very impressed. So he got in touch with me and said, what can we do to raise awareness? So uh, I attended an inspection as a researcher and uh, the inspector is allowed to bring a researcher into an inspection and the researcher is allowed to have access to a third of the population. So I was able to do uh, a brief screen using standardized assessments on a third of a young offender institution. And that led to the first paper I wrote, which was it was published um, about this population. So I have another question, like, um, because the, I guess this approach was more as a researcher than uh, the, getting close to this population. And because of the many different studies you've done later, do you have the do you have like um, feeling that or even fact that these services have improved their uh, have been improved with SLT? Uh, yeah. Yeah. After because of mm. you know is there is there been a transfer or you know improvement in their services? Um. Yeah. There certainly has. Um. In around uh, 2008. I was able to gain a research grant, um, which was to establish whether speech and language therapy could be delivered in a young offender institution. So I set up in England, bear in mind there was a service in one place in Scotland. I set up in England the first speech and language therapy services within two young offender institutions. One was small, And the other one was very big and had young people who were convicted, so had a sentence, but also young people who were on remand. So they were awaiting their trial. They would be considered too dangerous to uh, not not hold. Um, and when you work in an institution that has remand prisoners, They're coming and going all the time. It's very complicated. The population is big. It's changing all the time. The risks are much higher. And um, the prison service said, well, you can't just get away with showing you can work in a small institution. You've got to be able to show that you can cope in that environment. So what we did was we... Um, developed a screen which the induction officers could use but they didn't ask the questions to the young person because remember if you say do you have difficulties the young person will say no they asked themselves is this person able to communicate with me is this person understanding everything I say have I got a gut feeling all isn't well? That They were essentially the three questions. So induction officers are really skilled at assessing and just weighing up people. They didn't feel confident referring, but with the screening questions, they felt able to refer. They quickly then signposted to speech and language therapy. We carried out a screening. We didn't get a single referral through induction officers that was inappropriate. However, we did miss people. So other people in the institution could also refer. And by the end of the two year project, um, anybody who was not thriving or not engaging or being a behavior problem Um, got referred to us about six months into their sentence. So then we realized we were picking up more systematically. Um, so we showed that we could operate in those environments. We showed that we could get the staff on our side. We could engage with staff. And um, I'll tell you a funny little story. We, we were quickly well-respected. Um, because um, many of the people we uh, were dealing with were considered a problem. So the, the label that was given to them was that they were chair chuckers. Most things in those environments are screwed down. Sorry, what does chair chuckers mean? It uh... means that you throw a chair. <laughs> okay. So okay. things, are, things like tables chuckers. are all screwed down. Um, any equipment is screwed down. But 
if you sort of get desperate and you want to lash out, you throw a chair or you push the chair over aggressively. And so these children were called chair chuckers. And the staff realized that we were really good with them, that we could get them to engage. We could help the staff to engage with them because we were recognizing their language. Mm. Um, so that just helped us to become a part of uh, the team. Um, so we were able, again, we couldn't say that speech and language therapy itself was affecting improvement, but we could show that adding speech and language therapy to the regime uh, gave you demonstrable outcomes. The prison service was interested in language improvement, but they were also interested in delivery of outcomes within the institution. So, um, achieving a young person going to education, helping education so that they could keep the young person, getting the young person into some sort of uh, job training. Um, and what we might be doing is working with the staff to make sure that they were aware of the language difficulties and facilitating, for example, understanding. So within these settings, yes, it's great if language improves, but they also want you to demonstrate that you can add value. Um, so that's the, the type of work, work mm -hmm. that's done. Others now, such as Pamela Snow, are getting the funding, and of course there is an evidence base, to start to justify what I would call proper clinical trials, which is really a very significant development for the field. I was I also say that you all, um, you also changed the point of view from those workers, isn't it? There was like uh, an impact yeah. on the on the workers there, and yeah. how you look at those uh, people, and and that was so. How you've been talking about that in your presentation, but how can we really differentiate between mental issues or their you know behavioral problems and? And when, so maybe there's also need of working with, uh, together with psychologists, with other professionals, mm. and, and also raising awareness with, uh, with uh, psych uh, in the psychologist uh, background about, uh, or even educating psychologists about language and language assessment and how that can impact in, in, their, in, their, in other uh, behavioral and uh, other issues. Yeah, I mean, I think differentiating language difficulties and mental health difficulties is quite difficult. You know, if you have somebody with um, schizophrenia um, whose language is disorganized, you know, d differentiating between that and a language difficulty is, is quite hard. But uh, in a sense, you can demonstrate that a language difficulty is in the mix. You, you can't you you can't get to a sort of causal position. Um, I think that because it's difficult for people who are not trained to recognize communication difficulties in the way that speech and language therapists are, um, a key part of our role is raising awareness among other staff. So, um, you know, when I was working at the high secure hospital in all the work and the services I've run in young offender institutions, training up the staff is really important. Some people will, will opt to come to a training session. And if I was ever asked for a training session, I'd always, you know, facilitate delivering that. Um, but there are lots of other opportunities. So, for example, in the young offender institution where I set up the services, you couldn't run a group without having, um, depending on the size of the group, one or two assistant governors. And the governor sort of told me this and said, well, you know, do you still want to go ahead with those groups? And I said, yes, absolutely. But I want, I want, I'll have two deputy governors, but I want two who are really interested, who will really see this as an opportunity for them to gain knowledge. And they told us that they learned loads. They, they became so much more aware. Um, they were picking up lots of tips from us around how to scaffold language, how to have a discussion and pick up on points that the young person said rather than just asking questions all the time. So I think 
Um, it's really important when you work with staff to exploit informal training as well as formal. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so we have a few questions in mm -hmm. the chat and Nerea Alvarino is asking, um, so he's referring to assessment and how can we assess a child, not adolescent, if his her uh, bridging comprehension abilities are not good enough to understand what we want to say? Uh, sorry, written. Did you say written comprehension or verbal comprehension? Uh, she said she said written. Yeah, written comprehensive oh. abilities are not good enough. So, yeah. Um, so if you if you take a test like the test of adolescent language T O A L or the KELF. The KELF. Um, yeah, we have the KELF here. In yeah, yeah, you too. have the KELF. Um, so. Um, we, you, we don't need to read and comprehend. Yes, exactly. Skills, you don't. You, you, that some of the tests are verbal. So when you know there are literacy difficulties, then you know they're going to show low language on the literacy on, on the written test. Sorry. So in a sense, they're not so helpful in this situation. But the verbal tests are. Um, you don't need written comprehension, so that's helpful. But also. The structure of the language, the instructions are quite simple. The format of the test is quite simple. So you may have to explain very carefully. You may need to break down the instruction. You absolutely need to check back that the young person has understood. But those tests are constructed to try and help you get around that problem. And obviously, if the child is much younger, there are play tests, that sort of thing, which would really help you with that issue. Yeah, I guess like it, as you explain your talk and we are going to continue talking next uh, round table is uh, like adolescents, uh, we, can, we can still focus in on assessing oral abilities and actually this this huge uh, development and important to strengths. Uh, you, you talk, you mentioned different facts, different evidences, even in brain and how the millennialization. And so that's, yeah, that's this reason to continue assessing oral communication. But there is another question about assessment and this is more related to which types of tools you've already mentioned in some of the your studies uh, tools you used and the um, Marta Estevez is asking which type of tools would you recommend to use more conversational uh, standardized so actually I was I was thinking about that too so the conversational um, could you extract more information or maybe because you mentioned that they might don't want to recognize their difficulties, that might be a first good approach to for the assessment? Or I don't know, what's your opinion on? Um, yeah, so um, I mentioned the toll and the kelf. Uh, British picture vocabulary test is also uh, useful. Um, so you simply show a picture and you ask for the word and then you get the standardized measure. Um, but you can also use that to um, uh, get, say, 20 words that the person definitely understands. They've demonstrated that on the test and then ask them to give you a sentence with that word in it. That will give you a good indication if they have, they un definitely understand the word correctly, but they have difficulty putting information into language. So sometimes you can adapt a test. Um, there are tests of narrative where you see um, a picture or a series of pictures and you're asked to describe it and you then transcribe the language. Um, <clears throat> the, they're good tests. Um, but some young people will find um, that type of picture format a bit insulting and will then be annoyed with you and will not want to do it. Um, I always find that by saying, oh, I'm really sorry about the pictures, you know, I hope you don't mind. Well, you, you can often get away with it. You know, they can have a grumble about the pictures, but they'll then do the test. Um, <clears throat> I've always found that um, uh, a discussion, so <clears throat> the kind of informal assessment, you know, what do you, what do you like doing? Tell me about yourself. That you, you might get um, 
unexpected content, but just go with it, you know, get them talking. And then you get a sense of the person you get a like the example I gave you be, you know, what does he do when he's in difficulty? He doesn't do anything. He tries to walk away. If he can't walk away, he fights, you know, you, you, you get that picture of what's happening with the person. And then when you say to a key worker or a staff member, oh, you know, he's talked about this, they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, that absolutely. And then you can talk to the staff member about why is this happening. So um, I think the informal assessment is good. The Broadmoor assessment, which um, tries to, uh, I mean, it, it is only as good as the skill of the person who conducts the but but you basically you have a chat with the person and then you rate things like turn taking um the timing of turn taking whether the content is appropriate so that was just a way of trying to sort of measure that kind of informal uh, assessment but if you're going to try and convince authorities like the youth justice board in the uk or the prison you know the head of the prison service um you really need the standardized assessments because that you know that gives you the convincing data mm -hmm. even if you're going to write a report for a judge you know saying they scored this it's indicative of a comprehension level of a seven-year-old the judge it's proper evidence and they are now understand what you mean mm -hmm. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, that was great, great tips, <laughs> great advices. And uh, well, uh, like I have my own experience. Uh, like recently I was in a trial, I had to go for, for another reason. And I had that experience about the question in the, the close question you said, mm -hmm. the other person was not an, a Spanish speaking person. And that person was asked, Uh, because clearly uh, he was not understanding and he, he, they asked, uh, so do you understand me? And he was like, yes, you know, he, he was yeah. like, he wanted to, you know, accommodate to the, to the, to the justice person. And, mm -hmm. and that was, so what are other, you, you mentioned that uh, some strategies such as refreshing, like um, for people helping people uh, were not that practical actually so saying to uh, um, judges or people involved in the and the justice system so you should reduce your language and and or other like rephrasing rephrasing strategies but and you then mention about those assistants what would you think would be the best resource right now to include in the justice system like when the trials you know before a screening or whatever but yeah um I think that the registered intermediary program is is showing that you the registered intermediary assesses language. They they may do it informally. They they may do some tests. So they assess the language. They write a report, and they make recommendations for how to facilitate language. Um, those recommendations are agreed with the judge. There is something called a ground rules hearing where the judge can challenge the recommendations. But or, or so, for example, that the lawyer can't use uh, questions with uh, embedded structures, uh, can't use closed verification questions. Um, sh the child or the young person doesn't um, understand time, doesn't understand before or after. So you would demonstrate that in your assessment and say none of the questions should have a, did you do this before you did that, you know, should, should not include. So it's very detailed, very specific. The judge will agree that. Sometimes the judge will ask for the barrister's questions to be checked by the registered intermediary. And then during the trial, the intermediary will ensure that the person is understanding and they will intervene if the barrister doesn't stick to the agreement. So if the barrister slips in a closed verification question, the intermediary will have agreed with the judge that they put their hand up or whatever. And the judge will ask, what's the problem? We agreed none of those structures. Quite right. Withdraw the question or say to the intermediary, please, could you 
phrase that appropriately. So it's individual. The registered intermediary is there to facilitate the language. They are not supporting the person. So the person could give information which is incriminating. That doesn't matter. Your job is to get the information, not, not to support the person. But that's very expensive. Um, it's obviously very time consuming and you have to meet quite a high bar for this for it to be recognized that you need the service but though there's a similar uh, scheme now in new zealand uh, and also in northern ireland so i think there is an awareness that for people with complex uh, language needs often other comorbidities, this type of intervention is really essential. Okay, and I think that's really related to, I'm sorry, I didn't see, there was another question in the chat uh, to Celia Teira's question. She said, what about communication accessibility in the justice system in your country? And you even mentioned about other countries and are alternative systems considered for testi testifying? Okay. Um, I mean, I think the registered intermediary system has demonstrated that this type of help is needed, but we're constantly frustrated by um, failure to recognize the language problems and then not using uh, an intermediary. So, you know, um, the first trials in the UK of um, the, the sort of multiple sex abuse trials, the, the children didn't have access to registered intermediary and they were traumatized by the trials, even though some people went to prison as a result of them. So you might say they were successful, but it was recognized in reporting afterwards that the children were traumatized and should have had help from registered intermediaries. So now, if there are these trials which often have very vulnerable young people, multiple defendants, each with their barrister, now a registered intermediary would be involved. And in some of the more recent trials, it's been agreed that if, say, there are six defendants, six accused people, each with a barrister, they can't have six lots of um interviewing with the uh, with the victim or, or the witness um, they have to have one barrister for all of them and there will be a registered intermediary so we are making progress but it takes time of course also um, registered intermediaries are being asked to train police officers um, we have something in the UK called Section 28, which is a new initiative to enable a very vulnerable person to have video recorded evidence and, and not actually then um, go, to, go to court. So there are interventions coming and all of these interventions add knowledge to the justice system, but it does take a long time for these things to become sort of automatic. So thank you so much, Karen. Uh, actually, it's uh, great. And I really hope this talk and our workshop helps and uh, to raise awareness in our country and in place that they so see this, this presentation. So we are going to continue with the following uh, presentation and round table. So Karen, I will ask you to continue and maybe join us in the okay. uh, round table. Great. And uh, uh, First of all, uh, let me uh, remind you that you will have available the slides in the YouTube presentation. Actually, this is going to be recorded, uploaded. So then, in the same link that you have, you are watching right now, you will you you have to present the slides because uh, we know it's been a lot of information. You may take want to take notes and get the references. So we're going to continue with a round table about language development during the school stage. Um, first, uh, Professor Maria Arce and Professor Giuseppe Kerr are going to briefly introduce uh, to us uh, about the importance of studying language development in, ad in adolescents. And then we'll open a round table. Of course, you are very much um, 
welcome people from the audience to raise questions and uh, and talk about uh, together with uh, professor karen bryan about relevant things so is it relevant to target le later language abilities in speech therapy or which challenges do SLTs face in their diagnosis in during uh, this uh, age range of adolescence so let me introduce you uh, maria arce is a professor in linguistics in uk at the university of green which she obtained a PhD in theoretical linguistics and language acquisition under the supervision of Tim Stowell um, and Violeta de Monte. Her research falls within the syntax semantics interface, focusing on tense, aspect, argument, structure, and copular verbs. And she has studied these topics in the grammar of Spanish, their cross linguistic variation, and acquisition. And uh, actually, we met uh, because she coordinates an international research uh, group to study the language development during the school years and, and to promote awareness about language needs across population sectors and countries. And uh, let me introduce you. Um, uh, professor Josep Kerr, he is an ICREA research professor in, at the Department of Translation and Language Sciences of the Pompeu Fabra University, and uh, where he leads the Catalan Sign Language Lab. Um, his research focuses on different aspects of syntax and semantics of line, sign languages, as well as Romance languages uh, and Greek. Um, so he's a member of the research group Atlas, and that starts in the NIAS, uh, which is the group that uh, Maria is leading. And he has led the projects uh, of SignGram, different projects from Cost Actions, Horizon, and, and national um, grants. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for being here. OK, thanks. Thanks, Alfonso. So shall I start? sharing i imagine yes no? please. okay right can you see it all right yeah okay thank I you so i think you need to share the slide now like uh the presentation mode in the slide yeah i am in presentation mode you share the screen but yeah. uh, now okay now we can see it okay okay perfect. So now, all right, perfect. All right, well, thank you very much. As Alfonso has just said, um, so my, uh, I am a syntactician by training, but I am here because one of the latest adventures has been to uh, organize projects around the development of language in the school years. And, uh, and Giuseppe and I are here today presenting on the, on the research and the program, the agenda that we have started in, in the Netherlands with the colleagues that you see in, on the screen. So with Angelique Van Hout, Alex Perovic, uh, Janet Schaeffer and Petra Schulz. We are all linguists. Uh, focusing on different aspects of language uh, development and language properties. And uh, that is because we have an interest in different uh, populations, um, as he said. So in this talk, this is going to be a very brief talk. And I'm going to focus on some of the aspects that Karen and Alfonso have uh, hinted at already. The fact that we need to raise uh, awareness about the fact that language is not uh, finished its acquisition process in uh, in the in early childhood, uh, but that language continues developing in uh, importantly into the school years. What we have talked the decade of six to sixteen, but that decade is only because that co uh, covers what is typically the period of uh, mandatory schooling. But I added the three dots to 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 mark to signal that. Uh, of course, language continues uh, developing. We, in, in our team, we are raising awareness about the need of interdisciplinary teams, and in particular to, uh, about the need of including linguists who can bring um, details about the development and, uh, and, uh, and, and possibly contribute to assessment uh, details uh, as well to improve all the system around language development. And we have, uh, we are also working hard in raising awareness and enthusing activism in the fact that Karen has mentioned repeatedly in her, um, 
in her presentation about the fact that language needs are not recognized enough across situations and across sectors, uh, across countries. So what uh, our group has uh, been working on is uh, about, uh, we have identified uh, some gaps and I'm going to focus on uh, two of them here. The fact that there are gaps in the knowledge of what are the milestones in a typical development uh, during the school, uh, the school years, this period of age, and the fact that there is not enough language screening during the school years, as Karen has also mentioned, and the fact that these assessment tools do not seem to be linguistically informed in a sufficient manner. So if all we all together pulled our forces together, then all these um, the tools that we need and the culture that we need to change so that a young population gains uh, in, in having recognized all their the, the linguistic profile, all the situation would improve. The relevance for this, we've talked a lot about it, is because uh, the, the, uh, having an identified language needs are at the root of um, all these problems that are related, as Karen has presented, the poor school performance, the mental health issues, antisocial behavior, unemployment, and finally, in some cases, even criminal behavior. So our goals are uh, these three goals, raise awareness. So we are working hard in raising awareness. And this is something that Giuseppe is going to speak more about. Uh, the need to tackle different populations as well. We feel that several, many times, some populations are forgotten. And Alfonso has mentioned an occasion when he went to trial and he had a non-native speaker uh, going through that situation. So what happens with non-native uh, non or, or multilingual speakers. Uh, we are working on establishing uh, language developmental milestones uh, for this period uh, of age. And we are um, raising our voice to say that linguistically, in, uh, that language assessment should, uh, could improve if we increase the level of linguistically information in them. And I'm just going here now to, to, to focus, to give you some very um, light touch on why we need to put the emphasis on language acquisition in this period of age of the school years. We, we know and we have heard as well before that, of course, it's now a no-brainer, but still we need a lot more of um, awareness about it, that there are some phenomena that develop late right in the lexicon so abstract nouns develop develop late for syntax karen has mentioned the narrative abilities the complexity of the sentences and of course in semantics you know the way in which you can uh, bring all those pieces together what we are doing in particular in this part of our research agenda is to go into much deeper detail bring in the knowledge that has been accumulated in the linguistics literature. We are not saying that we are going to do everything from scratch, but part of our duty is going to put all the knowledge together and crossing the bridge uh, and bring it to other, other spheres of knowledge and disciplines like speech and language therapy. So I'm just going to, what we have here is just an example of something that has been very well researched in the linguistics uh, field about um, something that develops late, that is acquired very late. And with this, what we want to show is that we are trying to go beyond abstract and vague notions as long sentences or sentence complexity or embedding. So what we have here is um, a slide about uh, an illustration about the acquisition of the quantifier each, right? So uh, this was an experiment, a linguistic experiment, where um, ch uh, children of different ages were presented slides and then they were asked, uh, if I say each boy is washing a boat, a boat, is it true if I show you the picture on the left? Uh, or is it true if I show you the picture on the right? This is the classic linguistic comprehension task. And then they are supposed to say yes on the left and no on the right. Well, when these authors uh, looked at the results, 
we, they saw that uh, kids were not accurate, highly accurate, until the age of 10, which is very high, right? It's very late. So um, the reason why we, we, you know, we are bringing examples like this is to show there is a lot about language. There's a lot about language that happens to be acquired very late. And we are talking about typically developing kids. So um, typically developing kids acquiring nitty gritty like this very late. This uh, also is leading us to question the diagnostic tests and see, okay, what if we paired and put together the, uh, what we know about linguistics with what is assumed in language tests? And here I'm going to speak only about one uh, feature that we have identified at the moment, because as I said, we are now in, a, in, a, in the beginning of the project of the research agenda. And for example, looking at a test like self or kelf and, or trog, we are finding some misalignment in terms of the um, uh, phenomena that they are addressing and the age that it has been assumed that these phenomena were acquired. Um, if, for example, this is an example from the KEL5 uh, in a task on the page of five, you know, for these items. So these are real items from the test, item 19 and 23. And if I pick one, because we've mentioned before in Karen's presentation, the difficulty with time uh, ordering, right? Um, we, we didn't know before uh, when exactly time ordering was critically acquired. And, but we know now in, uh, from research in, um, in acquisition that sentences that contain temporal, uh, temporal conjunctions like before are acquired, we know in different languages in Finnish, for example, after eight, and uh, which is late again and around 10 in languages of german and greek we have very we don't have enough evidence of, of what happens in other languages so that is the research agenda but that shows that if this is the reality if this is when things are acquired across languages and this is where the research more research is needed then we should be modifying also the, the assessment tools right the assessment tools. So um, this was a presentation of our uh, linguistic particular agenda where we have we want to bring finer tuned knowledge uh, to uh, improve uh, the reality that touches up uh, with uh, speech and language therapists. And now I'm going to pass the floor to Josep, who is going to speak about uh, our manifesto because the other part of our agenda is the societal agenda to raise uh, awareness. So, Josep, I'll mute myself and then... Yeah, thank you, Maria. Yep. So, one of the outcomes of uh, this initiative has been the um, writing up of a manifesto, let's say a declaration that uh, has the title, uh, Think Language First. Next. And uh, this declaration comes actually from a, from a workshop that we held last year in uh, the University of Leiden in the Lawrence Center, um, which uh, had as a title language development, diagnosis and assessment in school ages, uh, six to 16, which is the age range that we focus on. It was a, a, a very international uh, workshop, both uh, on site and online because of uh, COVID restrictions, but we managed to get together up to 60 participants and a very diverse um, um, range of uh, specialties uh, among those participants. So we had linguists, we had speech and language therapists, we had pediatricians, lawyers, education consultants, health economists, uh, also parents as, parent associations and some professional bodies. Uh, people who participated uh, came from 10 different countries and we uh, were discussing together, uh, listening to presentations, but also actively engaging in, in discussions uh, uh, all through uh, the workshop for a whole week. So a total of, of 40 hours, uh, at least uh, that, that, that was the formal uh, uh, limit of the, of the workshop because of course uh, discussions went uh, on after the, the, the end of the, of the day. Um, so next. Yeah. 
um, so uh, as you can imagine, I, I mean, one of the targets of, of this workshop was to have some kind of uh, um, instrument uh, after we would finish the, um, the workshop that we could use for, uh, for lobbying and for, I mean, in, in each one of the countries that uh, were represented at the workshop and beyond, of course. So uh, we went to a manifesto that um, had to be international, but also intersectoral. So including um, both academic and non-academic perspectives. Uh, given the, the nature of the um, range of participants, uh, it should also be inter interdisciplinary. Um, because that's also one of the of the main goals of the uh, of the initiative, and we also discussed uh, at length the uh, the need to have a linguistic focus in the in the initiative because that uh, we felt as organizers that uh, this was missing in, in much of the uh, let's say practical uh, on the, on the, on pra in practice, uh, and as we said, we focused on school age, um, including these adolescence uh, years. So at the, well, at the workshop, we had uh, some brainstorming sessions uh, that uh, actually provided a lot of material for writing up uh, this um, manifesto. And then after the workshop, which I mean, was very intense and, and uh, we had to work on it um, for a couple of months and some people contributed to it uh, very significantly uh, among which, uh, among whom the co-organizers of the workshop, uh, Professor Karen Bryan, um, uh, Professor Helen Harris from Utrecht University, Jim Gross, uh, who is a UK government advisor on, on related topics. Uh, also Derek Mann, uh, who is the Director of Policy and Public Affairs of the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists in the UK, and Professor Ann Baker from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, so uh, let's say from the input uh, that we got from the workshop, plus the input we got from this uh, from the Atlas group, um, um, enlarged with uh, uh, input from, from these colleagues, we came up, to, uh, came up with a text of a, a two-page manifesto uh, that we will briefly present uh, next, not in its real form, um, because it would be too long, but we, we created a sort of a, a summary of a landing text uh, uh, for you to get a gist of uh, what's in that manifesto. So uh, we start out from a vision uh, where uh, we want to live in a world in which every child has equal opportunities to achieve their best. Uh, language is seen as the gateway to quality of life and educational attainment. So this can only happen if the ability to develop language is well supported. So this is what where we want to get. Um, the facts, uh, you, most, you, you know most of them, some of them have already been discussed here today, but uh, just to highlight uh, the ones that are mentioned in the manifesto. So language needs are more common than uh, people think. Uh, and the facts are that around 10% 10 of the children have language difficulties, either on their own, uh, let's say DLD, or in combination with another condition such as autism or learning disabilities. Um, then we have the population of deaf children. Um, around 95% of that population uh, does not have exposure to language early enough in life. And this leads to delayed and a typical uh, language development or even uh, to language deprivation in some cases. Um, we also find an increasingly large number of children that face challenges uh, associated with growing up with more than one language. So multilingual children, this is not a condition, but it, uh, it might lead to language difficulties because of the sociolinguistic set setup of our societies. Um, there, we also have children with, from, most, uh, from the most socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds, um, uh, and they are twice as likely to experience language delay. Uh, in addition, we have severe language difficulties um, that are often associated with behavioral problems, school dropout or exclusion, mental health problems, unemployment, and even criminality. Uh, and Karen just gave a, a, a great uh, presentation about this aspect. And last but not least, uh, because uh, governments and uh, officials want to hear about this, so untreated language difficulties result in a staggering cost for health and justice systems. Uh, we have data from a few countries, and one of uh, those countries is uh, the UK, of course. Uh, so in the UK, there is failure to improve the vulnerable. Uh, so the, the calculation is that failure to improve the vulnerable language skills of a current cohort of three-year-olds in the country uh, leads to a cost of uh, three, uh, 330 million uh, pounds later in life uh, cost for society. Uh, 
and, and as you understand, this is a, an estimate of all kinds of uh, services. These uh, adults in the future might uh, 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 need. So um, um, as you realize from, from uh, the presentations uh, so far, so language needs are dif uh, and difficulties are not clearly obvious to the outsider and uh, they are frequently overlooked and they constitute thus a lifelong invisible challenge. Um, and this is our challenge uh, as a group as well. So next, what we propose as a starting point from this manifesto, um, um, and which involves a lot of uh, work in the future uh, to deploy all these uh, actions. We want to work with, an international, with international stakeholders in order to raise public awareness of this invisible disability and to get it properly recognized. We also want to improve identification of language needs by providing reliable language screening measures and introduce assessment of language at all critical points of transition in the school journey. Um, uh, which uh, is uh, for most of it lacking uh, so far in, in many countries, at least in many of the countries that we uh, know of. Uh, we also want to train and support uh, professionals in education, in health, in social care and in justice um, so that they can recognize uh, language challenges and, um, and they can uh, address them uh, adequately. And finally, we uh, would like to call on decision makers to develop policies uh, to ensure that children and young people with language needs are properly identified and supported throughout the school journey and beyond. And as you see, um, the manifesto is uh, very ambitious um, because it tries to cover all kinds of language needs and all kinds of different populations that face language needs in, in different ways. Uh, but uh, I think we think that uh, there is a need for the recognition of the whole issue of language needs, not just uh, scat, uh, like addressing scattered groups, which is, it might be efficient, but uh, um, drawing attention to the uh, overall uh, issue of language needs is uh, a major need uh, uh, currently. And the manifesto exists. It has been signed up by a number of people. And um, uh, I think we can distribute it uh, among, the, uh, I mean, among, among you. If you write to us uh, next, uh, Maria, uh, if you write to us to this uh, email address in language first uh, at gmail.com. And if you, if you want to uh, adhere to, I mean, it will be displayed uh, in the near future on, on a website that is being created right now for the, for the whole initiative in language first. Um, and there, there will be the possibility to, to sign up. But if you want to, to read it uh, even before that happens, uh, just send an email to us. And with it, the, the major goal that we have is to lobby at a national level, but also an international level, um, ideally at a European level. And uh, associated to that, uh, we are planning to have a launching uh, event uh, for this manifesto. So uh, that was it. Um, I don't know how long uh, we took, but probably too long. Thank you very much for the attention and uh, we are open for questions and comments. And also for the invitation to join the uh, workshop today, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Josep and Maria for this nice talk. So very important, very important. And uh, we hope this uh, today's um, uh, okay, uh, I was I, I wasn't sure that we had uh, the screen. I can see myself right now, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Karen to join our conversation uh, because uh, she she formed part of the of the process of the manifesto, and and I would like just to for for the few uh, we have half about half an hour, fifteen minutes, maybe. So first question that I don't know how you want to address it, like maybe. One, each of you can talk about it, or, or yes, one person, or we, we can see how, how can we answer them. So why is it important to have an international research agenda to study language development? Why is it important to join forces from different countries? That would be my first question to you, uh, Maria Giuseppe, and of course, uh, Professor Karen, uh, if you want to answer too. Mm -hmm. I can say something, and then Giuseppe can, can complement. Um, I mean, for us, um, I think that one of the reasons is because us being linguists, we are very much tuned 
towards language uh, contrast, language and cross-linguistic, cross-linguistic understanding of phenomena. So we is never enough for us to see that we have understood one specific language case, one specific language phenomena. We are always trying to, I mean, we always compare it to how it works in other languages because ultimately we want to understand the ability that humans have. So that is always inside our nature and we uh, and, and is part of us. And, and we didn't conceive also to uh, change things in one country or society and then leaving all the others um, where the rest of members of, of the group were part of uh, untouched. And we tend to form international groups because of the language. And then once it's formed, it sort of follows from there. I mean, that's and also to increase reach. Actually, not only about international, but different population, isn't it? Because oh, well. we had... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if Giuseppe, you want to... Well, about the, let's say, international scope of the, of the initiative, I think, uh, I mean, there is, there is expertise uh, scattered through the continent. I mean, we, we, we are, let's say, our scope is European so far, uh, which is ambitious enough. Um, but there is expertise, and I mean, we're very lucky to have the, the UK uh, in the group, uh, very well represented, because I mean, in many aspects, uh, they are ahead of other uh, countries. Um, so, I mean, we can gain, um, uh, um, let's say, a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise uh, from, from, from them. Um, but also, I mean, it's very, I mean, comparing, uh, I mean, practice across countries is also a way to understand what, where the difficulties lie. Right, because uh, I mean, um, having SLT intervention setting up, set, uh, set up in very different ways can lead to, to different uh, outcomes and different results. So, um, and also different traditions. Uh, I mean, in practice, and also the I mean, how practice interacts with uh, academia to the extent that it happens. Uh, this might also be different across countries. So, the, the international dimension I think adds a lot to the to the to the to the initiative. Um, Sure, because of course we can, if there have been some kind of solutions or ideas that can help to some countries and some uh, clinical um, uh, um, practices in, in different uh, settings or, or contexts, so that might help others. Yeah. Okay. And then, I mean, there is a tension, of course, because uh, I mean, it's related to particular languages, right? So the instruments are language particular, intervention is language particular, so... Um, you want you want to be international and, and cross country, uh, but at the same time you have to respond to your let's say local needs. Um, but I, I think um, yeah, it's a challenge, but it's a, it's a, a, also a way to strengthen. I mean, you are not alone. You you have this uh, international group of researchers that uh, not only provides input but also supports maybe in policy, uh, right? In in lobbying. Uh, I mean, the scale, uh, when you go international, the scale of the uh, uh, lobbying uh, can also be stronger uh, in that respect. Mm -hmm. Because languages do not follow the same structures or the same rules in every, in every uh, language. In every, so, so that's important then to understand. Okay, so now I was thinking about, and maybe I don't know if Karen, because I, I don't know if we can see Karen in the image too, that would be lovely if we can have that, but, uh, and, uh, but, so, as, um, sorry, I was, I was thinking about, about the linguistic background of uh, SLTs, and we were talking about comparing languages, and so how should we include, or maybe already linguistics are included in, in SLT programs, but as evidences from language development and linguistics are still developing, and we know that there's still more to do. So how we should keep updated the professionals that have already done their, their trainings, or maybe those that are already in the trainings in the, in the educational program. So I don't know, that's the first idea that I was thinking about. And then the second thing I was thinking about, about uh, uh, cross linguistics comparison, linguistic use to compare different languages. Would that be something like this kind of applied linguistic would be something relevant for SLTs somehow? I don't know. Is, is that might be interesting or useful for their practices? I don't know if you, Professor Karen. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, well, I think that uh, speech and language therapy training does include uh, linguistics, but it, you know, 
that training is starter training. So we all have a duty to uh, continue with our professional development. And there are lots of opportunities um, to, to learn more about linguistics. For example, the week-long conference that um, Josette referred to. Um, so we all need to keep up to date. But one of the starting points for the work was recognising um, that... Uh, second language teaching of language actually pays much more attention to the sort of later development in a way that we don't do, certainly in the UK, for, um, for English, you know, for first language English speakers. So that's why we wanted to be multidisciplinary, because you can learn from other professional approaches. Um, and I think you can also learn from other countries. So, for example, Denmark has a very good um, regular screening of young children's language. Um, so they are really way ahead of most other European countries. Thanks. Maria, you said, do you want to add? Maria, do you want to go ahead? I mean, for, for us... Oh, yeah. um, I mean, we are also working in to, in, I mean, including and collaborating with colleagues who at the moment uh, teach linguistics modules in speech and language therapy uh, degrees uh, to see what kind of fine grained detail is taught because we tend to think that in these disciplines, the fine grained detail may not be necessary. But we, uh, we want to say that we beg to disagree because it, the devil is in the details and sometimes it can be very helpful. So just to raise awareness about um, the fact that uh, language keys are not only in the three typical things that we have been listening to for decades. So it's not only embedding. We have to fine tune that because if we don't, uh, we may be missing the point altogether. It's the kind of embedding that we are talking about. It's the kind of subordinator that may give you the, you know, the cutting point between some uh, individual with DLD or versus another one who doesn't have it. So, and we had presentations in in the workshop about that as well, and it's about bringing linguistics to the table to say is not, I mean, if we bring it, we will have a much better lens to, to look through. And, and some, um, some, um, some cases, we, we, I think we are looking, um, we, they are still blurry. It's not enough what we have and we want to bring more. So it's, it's a better lens that we want to bring in. And it's, we have a lot of work to do on that front because we are aware that sometimes linguistics is not very well uh, understood. So what is it about? What's the need? And that is what we want to, to raise awareness of, uh, that to make the need clearer because yeah. there are benefits to it. And also, if I may add something, uh, I mean, there is a lot of knowledge uh, out there from, from uh, linguistics about uh, typical de uh, developing kids uh, that uh, is actually not reflected. It's not taken advantage uh, of uh, in the development of the tools. So, I mean, it's actually a matter of, of transfer from, from one field to the other. It doesn't mean that all SLTs need to belong linguist, to, to become linguists. That's not the point. Mm -hmm. but that the, the knowledge becomes operative in, in some way that that's why let's say the inter uh, sector, sectorial or multidisciplinary uh, character of, of the initiative is, is also very important and I mean but um, yes it's, it's about saying okay I mean we have uh, let's say a lot of uh, accumulated knowledge and of course there are many gaps that need to be addressed as well that can be useful also for practice uh, and the question is how to how to do this and um, I mean, the Atlas Group has as one of the goals uh, to set up this, uh, let's say, reference website uh, that um, concentrates, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the available knowledge about all these very different uh, uh, cases that we've been talking about uh, and making them available also for, for uh, practitioners uh, in the future. I mean, this is all in the, in the starting phase of uh, production, let's say. 
So, well, I think like from, from the experiences, uh, so actually it's a way also I think, in, I'm thinking about how to balance this fine-grained knowledge about uh, linguistics and language development that is seems to be really important to diagnose and really know which is developmental age of that kid, but at the same time with restrictions that uh, clinicians have in the so mm -hmm. from your experience from the experiences we heard in the in the workshop I think like it's very different depending on the country but I know well in Spain sometimes we don't even have time to to assess or we think that we don't have time to assess we don't open the space to do that so how can we balance that kind of uh, tool that can be so fine grained so in my imagination i think they're directed to something that's going to be time consuming and it's going to spend a lot of time with those restrictions and uh, so that those those were things that we were talking a lot in the in the yeah. in the workshop and how to balance that i don't know if you have any thoughts about what yeah, could but, help but for it uh, so, sorry can i say sure quickly? yes please. sorry is imagine that we just managed to get the the alignment between when something is acquired in typically developing kit and uh, a, an item in the kelp. That's what we are talking about. Rather than increasing, it's a matter of getting things right and and but but after having paid attention to the detail again. So that wouldn't increase. You know, if um, the the amount because of, of screening, because we understand the restrictions of life. Mm -hmm. but and I mean, probably um, um, let's say having a little bit more of a little bit more of uh, uh, training in linguistics in the, in the SLT curriculum uh, might be an improvement. Because I mean, even if there is uh, linguistics, uh, I mean, there might also be one type of linguistics that doesn't address these kind of uh, issues, right? Because uh, linguistics, uh, I mean, looking at language as communication, and that's probably too broad. I mean, of course, communication is. Uh, is a skill uh, that you need to address. But uh, looking at grammar, which is actually, I mean, the underpinnings of grammar are at the root of, of, uh, of assessment. Uh, that's, so yeah, it's, um, it's important to get to this fine greatness. I mean, maybe not as an individual SLT, but uh, I mean, the, 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 the tools um, and the instrument should address, I mean, should have these incorporated uh, into them. Uh, and of course, how to how to administer that? I mean, that's another issue. But um, I don't know. I'm not very much acquainted with the uh, with the field of practice. But um, I guess um, technology can be very helpful in that. I mean, having some some automatized kind of uh, of uh, administ administration administering of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, tools might might help the practitioner. I mean, the clinician. Uh. So now talking about how to administrate. Uh assessment tools and and sometimes there are specific populations that uh, we may not have a tool or maybe we are facing like i don't know the signers or we are facing multilinguals and we are in a country that we don't have tools uh, di directed to that language so then what what should we do what, what how can this uh i don't know this uh this thought how can we think about to to assess those abilities well, I mean, um, I, I don't have experience in this, but I, at least from 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 what I know about uh, uh, what is being done for for uh, uh, signers, I mean, who, I mean, this is clearly a, a population that uh, has a lack of uh, instruments uh, for assessment, right? And what what uh, has happened, at least very often so far, is adaptation. Of course, I mean, if there is if there is a good test that um, runs properly uh, for one language, then. The easiest you can do is, I mean, try to adapt that test uh, to another sign language, uh, mm -hmm. right? But of course, I mean, I, I would say the <laughs> the goal is, I mean, to invest in, in these tools. I mean, to, to clearly understand that, uh, I mean, you need a tool to determine whether a signer ha who has had a stroke uh, uh, has some kind of aphasia, uh, right? Which is very different from the... Uh, and, and to have that available uh, at, at the hospital, at the emergency room, because that's where the, the deaf signer with a stroke will, will uh, arrive, right? Or to have, uh, I mean, a, a protocol that addresses that, which is completely lacking uh, these days. So, I mean, it's a matter of, of seeing the problem and uh, realizing that it needs to be addressed. I mean, even if the populations are numerically small, right? I mean, uh, the, 
number of signers uh, is, is smaller than the definition on, on the number of speakers. Uh, but this is just one of the many examples that um, you can come up with. Uh. Karen, I think you raise your hand. Yeah, um, I mean, I would hope that some of the students attending seminars such as this might be inspired to think about their research projects, um, you know, where you could um, translate a test or use a test with a different population, um, layer some more detailed linguistic knowledge into um, a test. Um, you know, that could be a really, really valuable um, project. Um, but to give another example of what to do when there is no assessment, when I first started working at the High Secure Hospital, so this is people with very severe mental health problems, um, there was no test suitable for those adults. Um, there just simply wasn't. So um, I started experimenting with, for example, the Mount Wilger, which is a test used with people who've had head injury and um, the, uh, the graded naming test, which is the pictures are drawn for adults. And some of the tests were hopeless because they were too complicated that people couldn't understand the instructions. Some had pictures that were unacceptable. Some had parts of the assessment, like the Mount Wilger, which were really helpful. So what I did was um, we had a, a sort of specialist clinicians group that met occasionally. And so we had a session on, well, what do you do? What do you do? And immediately we could see three or four subtests that we were all using pretty much. So then we said, well, if we all use these and pool our data, because we were all in small populations, then we can have a look at whether this assessment is working. And eventually, um, we did pull together what we called a minimum data set, which was bits of other assessments that were acceptable to our adult population um, and where we found that the profile was very helpful in terms of us explaining the language difficulties to the team and also then developing uh, sort of remediation. So, I think you shouldn't underestimate the power of a group, preferably a multidisciplinary group, using some assessments and distilling from them based on data, uh, what will give you a useful first start. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So in a sense, how can we improve our assessment practices uh, with our group, that, uh, with colleagues? And, and I think we really have a lot of work to do at least in Spain and regarding so we may do assessment and we I think I hopefully I cross fingers that we assess and in order to um, know the different functions that know ability the abilities they have children or, or, or adolescents and um, and also for uh, diagnose purposes but I'm not that sure we use that much screening. I, uh, so about in, we have uh, Maria and Nadina, they are SLTs uh, and they've been working in clinics and, and I don't know, maybe we, they, they, they can talk about that later too or say what they, they think. But from my experience, there are not like in other countries that we learn in the, in the, in the workshop that there are some countries that are applying universal screening. Uh, maybe Karen can, can talk about that and when it's used and in school or I don't know, in early intervention, how, how is used this screening? Because I don't think we do systematically screening or like we don't have like national programs that are uh, uh, doing that. I don't know. But at the same time, I, I can understand there are some risks of universal screening. There, are, there were other countries, other species saying, okay, how much amount of money are we going to spend on the screening if we need to do it for people? So how 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 can we how can we balance that? I think um, in the manifesto, what what we've done is to use the research evidence. So we know that um, uh, adolescents with behaviour problems, adolescents with mental health problems, adolescents with difficulty engaging in school, um, adolescents who uh, have been excluded from school, we know that those groups are high risk for undiagnosed language difficulties. So we can start to use the research evidence to target um, 
so that's why in the young offender institutions, when I was running a service, at the six month point, we might well have missed a, a, a young person because we weren't systematically screening everyone. But at the six month point, there was a check on language and we we were finding people through those checks. So there are systems, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can put in place based on evidence to show where you can target um, the screening. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. I don't know, you said, Maria, if you want to add something regarding that. Okay, so I think we are about time. I don't know if you want to add any last comment uh, to your to this talk. Um, I would just like to say thank you very much for organizing this and uh, thank you for the to the participants for listening. I hope we've inspired you to uh, learn more about this area. It's a new and emerging field. So there are lots of opportunities to do some research, to adapt some clinical practice, to use some research evidence in practice and start to make a really big difference. So I hope that we've inspired inspired you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Yes, and thank you, Alfonso. Uh, I don't know if the audience knows that you've been part, uh, you've been part of the workshop, you were part of the workshop, you were one of the participants and, and uh, first subscribers of the manifesto. You are also part of other projects relating that will emerge uh, relating to youth offending. So yeah, yeah thanks hopefully. very much for including us here. Yeah, I thank you too. And uh, I just want to make uh, a note saying that, I mean, at some point we will uh, also present, we will launch a manifesto uh, in Barcelona or um, um, in Spain at, at, at some point. So you'll hear yeah. more about, uh, about it uh, from us. That yes. will be, that, that's great. And actually we can send to the people who have subscribed to, to this uh, workshop, we, if they, they tick the, the box saying if they agree with sending all the information, we will mm -hmm. be, have these uh, emails uh, available for more information. And of course we can continue the discussion in other forums. No, so sorry. thank you so much, uh, Maria, Josep and Karen. And uh, now we are going to continue with different, uh, but actually it's the same thing because we are focusing on adolescents uh, population and uh, from previous workshops i always really like to empower and and um, and uh, and make visible uh, slts who are already doing research and they are in early stages in their uh, scientific um, uh, development in the academia so First of all, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Mario Figueroa Gonzalez. He's a speech therapist and he's a PhD in psychology and com of communication and change from the UAB and AB. Uh, sorry, uh, so from the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona and the Universitat de Barcelona, I think. And Mario uh, Figueroa is a postdoctoral uh, researcher in the City University of London uh, with a Margarita Salas Fellowship. And he is working in a project with Dr. Gary Morgan in the precursors of theory of mind in infants with cochlear implants. His journey in the field of deafness began in 2014 when he completed a master's degree in language pathologies, and deafness, and neuro neurological disorders. At the time, uh, then he met uh, Dr. Nuria Silvestre and Sonia Darbra, and uh, who, who they supervised their thesis. So today he's going to talk about uh, does theory of mind contribute to reading in adolescents with cochlear implants. So, Mario. We cannot hear you now. No. Perfect. No. So. We can see your slides now. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, today, uh, Alfonso. Uh, as Alfonso said, uh, I'm going to
Yeah, we have some okay. audio difficulties, so let's try to fix it. Take your time, Mario. Better to have a good audio. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's improved. Hola, hola, hola. Mario, ¿puedes hablar? Hola. I think he's not uh, listening to us. No, nos está escuchando ahora. Yeah, no listen. Okay, let's uh, let's wait until he's uh, fixed. Uh, he's fixing now the audio with the uh, help uh, with the help of the technical, um, and uh, hopefully then it's working now. We can hear you now, Mario. I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's perfect. If we, will, if we will be in life, there will be some interruption, you know, some old door opening and all the things. So, okay, so okay. let's continue. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I will talk about uh, two, two abilities that I consider uh, that are, they are important for child development, such as fear of mind and reading. Um, and for, for starting, I would provide a definition uh, of reading comprehension. As you probably know, reading comprehension is the process of constructing and extracting meaning through the involvement uh, with uh, writing language. And in a adult sense, reading is not only uh, recording words, in a lot of sense, the texts uh, are more complex. So we need to, to talk about two terms that Karen, Professor Karen was explaining this morning, cohesion and co coherence. So cohesion uh, is used to, uh, to describe the relationships between uh, sentences or paragraphs. Uh, while coherence is the term uh, used to describe uh, the relations about meaning, no? mean, uh, meanwhile, cohesion is more re uh, referred to grammatical aspects. Coherence is more related to a semantical ones. And in these two aspects, uh, these two aspects are important because. Uh, uh, in deaf children, the children can have difficulties to understand uh, and follow the, this, the, the, the reading of a text because of these two aspects. So both aspects are related to, uh, with fear of mind, as we will see uh, later. Fear of mind is the ability to understand uh, all the perspectives and behaviors and intentions. And we can div divide this process into two, uh, into two process, the affective theory of mind and the cognitive theory of mind. The affective theory of mind uh, is used when you are trying to understand emotions and cognitive theory of mind is used when you are trying to understand uh, beliefs or thoughts or intentions. Uh, however, uh, in a lot of sense, um, 
theory man was as Carl as Carsey has studied. Um, and curiously, uh, in a lot of sense, there's a growth in emotional, social, and cognitive uh, aspects that lead to a development uh, on mentalistic capacities and social relationships grow too. Uh, the relation between uh, reading and, uh, and theory of mind uh, begins uh, in infancy. Probably you know, all you know this book. Uh, um, and the clearest relationship is uh, the fables. When you read a, a fable uh, like this one, you are thinking uh, in some intentions, maybe the wolf intentions, you are thinking about the desire of the wolf. Uh, about their, uh, about the, the, the reasons. And also you are thinking about, uh, about the feelings of uh, the little right, right in hood. You are feeling some sympathy because uh, the little, little red riding hood is uh, the good, uh, the good character in the story. So, uh, the the relationship between theory of mind and reading starts uh, in the infancy with the uh, acquisition of emotional vocabulary and social values. And this, uh, yeah, at the age of three, uh, children can understand and can adopt uh, another person perspective. Um, but they can have problems to uh, do some inference. In fact, until adolescence, they cannot uh, acquire the social structure of, uh, of a text. And in this stage, in the uh, adolescence, in the adolescence, they acquire also the, this critical capacity to read and to oppose, uh, to compare their thoughts uh, to the uh, author's author thoughts, and they can develop also some reading strategies that are helpful, helpful, helpful uh, to understand a text. And there's another point that is important too. Uh, the characters understand the characters' emotions because uh, this uh, makes us uh, be more engaged with with the text and understand more what the what the characters are feeling. So it can be related with uh, the engagement with the characters or with memories, our memories that we uh, believe or we live in the past um, something similar to the to the to the characters the recompression in adolescence uh, the, stu the studies uh, that are focused in this topic uh, claim that they have more difficulties than typical development population and Viewers uh, claim that the 40% of participants can obtain similar scores with uh, participants with cochlear implant. Um, but the gap between those adolescents with lower scores uh, and cochlear implant and the typical development will grow after after childhood. So the auditory um, deprivation and language deprivation of children with in, uh, cochlear implant 
uh, could affect to the prosody, to the perception of prosody. Um, prosody is very near to, to theory of mind because uh, is the linguistic aspect uh, the more more linked to 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 emotional aspect uh, or um, to feelings. So uh, they, because of the the deafness, have more problems to understand the prosody and their different uh, intonation. And for the reason, maybe uh, they have difficulties to uh, apply some precursors of theory of mind uh, before the language acquisition. And up to the language acquisition, these difficulties remain. So they uh, have a theory of mind delay, but what we don't know uh, if it is, if it's, delay continue in adolescence. Two works studied uh, the relationship between theory mind and, and reading. The first one uh, uh, stated that theory mind contribute uh, more than some linguistic aspects such as expressive and recept uh, receptive uh, vocabulary. And also um, the other study um, found the theory of mind was related with uh, reading comprehension. And this uh, interaction will be uh, mediated by uh, inference and memory. So the aim of, the, of our study was uh, to study the performance in reading and theory of mind. And it's uh, the relationship between these two competencies. In order to do this, we collect a sample of 90 participants, uh, 36 of them with cochlear implant. And as you can see in this, uh, on this slide, uh, both groups are, were similar uh, in nonverbal uh, intelligence and uh, their status, social economical status and the proportion of female and male. They were um, between 12 and 16 years old. They were uh, assessed uh, of reading with a prolac uh, battery and uh, was a minister also to task um, one uh, uh, related with emotional aspects, the four pass test. In this test, this test consisted of uh, a story of a misunderstanding between two friends and the questions were related with uh, the feelings of the protagonist. And a false belief task, uh, this task, uh, was uh, about these characters that you see in this image. Um, the protagonist was uh, playing the violin and after that uh, she um, saved the, the violin, the blue box, and she, got, uh, she went out and the sister came and the sister rearranged the, the boxes and put, um, yeah, the location of the um, red box is the same as the location of blue box originally. And so she, she saved here the, the violin. So uh, we asked to the, to, to the participants what they think where the protagonist uh, will will look when he came again, when she came again, sorry. So the results were the following. Um, 
in reading, as you can see in this table, um, the, the group with cochlear implant uh, obtained lower scores than the typical development group in every index and uh, also in the different uh, te uh, text. We assess expository comprehension and narrative comprehension. And uh, in both cases, the res results of uh, the group of uh, with cochlear implant were lower. But so 30% uh, of these participants with cochlear implant obtained similar scores in comparison with typical development uh, children. So we want to compare if there was an effect of hearing conditions in deaf group. And in order to do this, uh, the deaf group was split into uh, early uh, cochlear implant, late cochlear implant, and typical development. Um, what we see, uh, what we saw, sorry, was that um, the late cochlear implant group obtained lower scores than typical development group, while the early cochlear implant uh, obtained similar scores. To be honest, they are lower than uh, typical development, but they are not different statistically. Uh, and we also split the sample um, between those adolescents with unilateral cochlear implant and those with bilateral cochlear implant. And the, the pattern was uh, the same again. The, these, uh, the adolescents with uh, poor uh, hearing conditions, poor hearing conditions obtained lower uh, scores in comparison with uh, typical development. Meanwhile, bilateral group obtained similar scores. Um, so early cochlear implant can be helpful to, to acquire some phonological skills, some phonological perception, and also uh, binaural hearing or bilateral hearing uh, could also improve this uh, disabilities and have more access to, to language. And as a, cause, as a consequence, uh, improve also uh, the, the reading uh, competence. Uh, regarding theory of mind, the results uh, showed that there was a difference between um, cognitive uh, performance in cognitive per, uh, in the cognitive task. The group with cochlear implant uh, obtained lower scores than the group uh, with typical development. Uh, so we make the we made the same process with um, uh, with the data, and we analyze the difference between uh, early uh, cochlear implant and uh, those with late cochlear implant, and we analyze also the effect of bilateral uh, implantation, and the pattern was again uh, reflected in the results. The, those groups with worse uh, hearing or auditory, auditory conditions uh, have more problems to, uh, to, to, to understand a text and to comprehend um, at the same way also, the, the, 
the stories, the mentalistic stories. And this could be related with the access to the prosody, as I explained before, and also with us access to the linguistic exchange in some uh, uh, context, some complex context with noise, with uh, reverberation, or with poor acoustics. And also, uh, there's an old important thing, having better auditory conditions can help to, to deaf children to uh, incidentally learn these uh, mentalistic capacities because normally uh, people, when they are talking about some aspects related with, uh, with Tom, for example, um, what is uh, wrong or what is right, um, is not teaching directly to, to infants or to children. Normally, you can hear that uh, because uh, you can, maybe you are going in the bus and you are listening to all the conversation, all the people conversation. So maybe um, it's also related with 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 this concept. When we analyze the relationship between reading and theory of mind, what we see is and and the group of, in the group of uh, with uh, sorry with Copeland plan with uh, we saw. Um, a relationship between cognitive, affective, and syntax, and reading comprehension. While in the case of the group with typical development, the relationship was only focused in the linguistic aspects. So for, uh, for deaf children could be more important. Um, apply these concepts, these uh, social uh, skills, this um, mentalistic to infer, th these mentalistic skills to infer what the author wants to say or what the, what the characters uh, feel. And also to, to follow the story of a text and finally have uh, the correct uh, interpretation and the correct uh, association between these cohesive, cohesive, sorry, cohesive elements, and also with the um, to arrive to to conclude to have an idea, a global idea of the text, and to acquire this uh, global cohesion that is very important to uh, to answer the questions. Uh, so as a conclusion, uh, I would to say that the reading and Tom skills are more developed in typical hero, typical development group than in corporal impact group. Uh, both synthetic knowledge and lexical knowledge are less consolidated in uh, corporal impact group, uh, which could influence reading. The difficulties uh, in literacy and tone could be reduced with an early uh, cochlear implant or with bilateral uh, condition. And a concept that I, I think that it was uh, talked uh, today, early intervention benefits language development, but it, it's not only necessarily focused in uh, early development because uh, what happened in adolescence uh, can be important also for uh, to know uh, what uh, how is the develop the development and how can be the for example the process of uh, theory of main uh, formation uh, and as the on the last uh, the last point is related uh, with uh, reading. Cognitive theory of mind and reading seem to be related in adolescence with cochlear implant. And this relation could be uh, 
could be related with uh, the cohesive elements, the interpretation of uh, inference, and to uh, and the necessity uh, to acquire this uh, global cohesion. So thank you uh, very much for your attention and that's that's all. Thank you so much, uh, Mario. Uh, congratulations for this nice study. Actually, we are running out of time. I didn't stop you because I saw that you were in your conclusions, but uh, um really sorry we don't have a lot of time for questions right now although i would like if you could quickly explain because i don't maybe it's a clarification question so you related the um, you said that uh, theory of mind is related to uh reading comprehension and in deaf children in hearing conditions with hearing conditions but not in typical developing group and then you uh, discussed, you sa said that that might be related to uh, the global, global cohesion abilities that are need to uh, understand the written. Uh, this. But I didn't understood if you measured the global cohesion, like maybe in the prolec, you could have some items or, or, or do you think that's something to do in the next future? Well, that's a problem. Uh, no, I didn't measure uh, global cohesion because there is no, a uh, standardized test, uh, as I know, in in Catalan, um, for adolescents, uh, in which these uh, aspects could, could be uh, could be known. So um, uh, it was not measured. Uh, all only we can discuss that the yeah the we we uh, use. A, the expository uh, text and the narrative text, and well, what now I would like to to analyze is precisely the difference uh, in their answers because I I couldn't measure directly with the test, but I could see I could see um, how they respond um, and what I uh, they when they answer sometimes they 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 make more uh, mistakes about the interpretation of, of questions for example uh, i remember something that it was the i i don't know in english the word but when you put something in uh, your feet maybe in some place and there's a mark mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the question was related with the um, with uh, the this part of the of the feet in, in Catalan uh, is planta or no and in Spanish too uh, and this planta uh, could be related with uh, another word that is uh, um, yeah is a uh, plant so. Uh, for example, some some children uh, uh, answer uh, related with with planta and the vegetable, and not with uh, with the feet. The feet related, one. for example. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, sometimes is uh, or for example, yeah, in the narrative uh, text, um, there's no a clear. Uh, there's no a clear clarification of if the one of the uh, characters is a person, a human, or is a dog. And some 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 children, when they read, they thought that it was a human, but it uh, really was a dog. So, yeah, they think that the the person was treated. As as uh, as was treated uh, was treated very very bad, in fact. But they were they thought that they were treated worse, uh, even worse, because the yeah they they uh, yeah they, the text talk about um, yeah about something. Well, I cannot um, be very specific, but yeah. They they make a lot of uh, mistakes about uh, the interpretation of of the sentences. Okay, I got an idea. 
Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Mario, and I hope you and well your your fellowship and and and, uh, and now we're going to continue with Dr. Nadina Maria Gomez Merino. Uh, great, we can see you now, Nadina. Uh, she holds a doctoral degree from the Reading and Comprehension Program of the University of Valencia, a junior coordinator of the Special Educational Needs Group from the European Association for Research in Learning and Instruction. She has a master in speech therapy intervention and bachelor's degree in speech therapy. And she's worked uh, as a speech therapist in several clinics attending infants and adults population. So uh, Nadina, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I will uh, turn off my camera because I'm, a, I'm aware that connection is not working really well for me. So uh, I turn it off and now I share my screen. Uh, let me see. Um, can you see it? Uh, we can see now the presentation, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so first, uh, well, I hope you can hear me properly uh, despite the connection. Um, thank we you. We can hear you fine. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, uh, what I will try to show you are uh, some studies that were part of my thesis work. And uh, both of them were carried out with eye tracking. So uh, before beginning, I would like to introduce you, those who are not familiar with uh, the methodology of eye tracking, what it is and uh, why do we use it for uh, communication research. Um, uh, so uh, most of you might know uh, that eye tracking has been used for as an assistive tool, but uh, it can also be applied to study communication and uh, all, all their aspects, all their cognitive aspects. So um, let me change the slide. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is a typical setup of eye tracking. As you can see, there's the participant who is reading uh, a sentence, and then there is a question. She's answering a comprehension question by clicking with the mouse. And the object you see below the monitor is the eye tracker that um, knows the position of the eye with the reflection uh, using this infrared light. And then uh, we can see on the system, the register, this is called the scan bar, and you can see with the uh, bubbles uh, that indicate uh, where the eye is fixating and the amplitude of the circle indicates more or less for how long. After that, we obtain a large uh, amount of data uh, with numbers that we analyze. We also analyze directly this scan bar. Okay, so let's see uh, how can eye tracking help us with a practical example. Uh, here we have uh, Mary and John, and uh, we have uh, Mary and John have completed a reading comprehension test, a sentence comprehension test, and both of them have obtained uh, correctly 20 out of 25 sentences. So. If I ask you now, uh, do you think that Mary and John have the same reading level? Maybe by looking at their correct responses, we might say, yes, they, they, they have the same number of uh, errors of correct responses. Yeah, they, they might have uh, the same uh, level. But let's go beyond that. And let's try to uh, register uh, this with eye tracking. Imagine we register uh, Mary and John with uh, uh, the reading on the sentences with eye tracking, and we obtain this scan pass. So uh, they read the sentence, the lion is chased by, by the gazelle. And um, if you look at the sentence below, the one which is uh, in blue, you will see that fixation, which are the circles, there are a higher number of fixations in the sentence in blue in comparison to the sentence in green. And moreover, the circles are uh, of, uh, bigger uh, are bigger than uh, the ones on the sentence in green. Uh, when someone uh, makes 
higher fixations in eye tract in a higher number of fixations or spends longer. This is um, interpreted depending on the task as uh, if they had a processing difficulty with a specific element or maybe they can increase fixations if they have uh, uh, found that something looks weird, there's an error in the text. So uh, taking this into consideration, if we go back to Mary and John and we complement this information with their results, if we look at both the scan paths, we might say, uh, we might answer differently to the answer, do they comprehend similarly? Maybe now we can say no. It seems that John, who, who has this campus in blue, uh, ha has made higher effort to comprehend the sentences than Mary, who has a, a straight uh, campus. So uh, now that we have more or less an idea of what uh, I track needs and, and the basis uh, of it, I will uh, show you as an example two of the studies of my thesis. Of course, I would like to say that these were my supervisors who guided me uh, through this process and who uh, contributed to this work. So, uh, both of the studies I will talk about uh, focus on population with deafness. And the reason we focus on this population is because the reading comprehension level uh, is still uh, delayed, uh, especially when they reach uh, secondary school. So uh, this is problematic, especially because we know that in secondary school, uh, students uh, even more need a good reading comprehension to obtain their knowledge from the text. So, uh, of course, linguistic factors influence on reading comprehension, but uh, several authors suggest that grammatical skills uh, play a critical role in, uh, in this case for students with deafness. So we decided to have a look at uh, how do they process grammar during reading. What we know so far is that uh, some authors suggest that students with deafness show a preference for using semantic cues. That is, they focus mainly on uh, content words and that they might ignore function words such as prepositions, articles, but uh, not all the authors agree with this statement. And uh, most importantly, uh, this uh, this uh, issue has been explored using uh, data from answers, like uh, this number of, uh, they have had this number of correct responses or errors, but not with measures that reflect reading in real time, such as is the case of eye tracking, who can inform about the processing. So uh, I will talk about uh, two of the uh, studies. One, uh, we focused on simple sentence comprehension and the other, we focused on complex sentence comprehension. Uh, to do so, we recruited a group of 20 students with deafness from fourth grade to 10th grade. They were all prelingual and had a bilateral severe to profound hearing loss. Despite efforts, they were not homogeneous uh, regarding the type of processes that is some uh, were equipped with a cochlear implant, whereas others were uh, hearing aids. And they all communicated through oral language. And also we recruited as a control group, a typical hearing group of 20 students with typical hearing, matched on the deaf and hard of hearing group on chronological age and non-verbal IQ. Here you can see the, uh, the procedure, the overall procedure. We first, uh, students first completed a set of background assessment. That, that's way we had an idea of the uh, vocabulary level, syntactic level, reading comprehension, uh, nonverbal IQ. And then in the third and the second or the third session, they completed three experimental tasks with eye tracking. 
So I'm going to explain really brief and quick uh, some of the results from our uh, one of our study with simple sentence comprehension, but for those who want to uh, have a deeper look at it, uh, there's the reference. Um, so these were the statements who guided the basis of our study one. Uh, first, uh, we know, as I say, that some of the supposed that students with deafness seem to show a preference for semantic cues, that is, they might ignore grammatical cues during reading processing. And we know little, but we know some things about their online processing. Mm, that is, some other supposed that mm, they seem to be sensitive to grammatical cues. Uh, but most of the research has been conducted with adults or with other techniques that not, are not as ecological as uh, eye tracking. Uh, so our aim uh, here was to explore uh, how did the uh, students with deafness comprehend uh, grammatical cues during simple sentence reading. And because of that, we uh, explore uh, the accuracy on this task. Of course, we need to take uh, that into account and uh, the online processing behavior by looking at their uh, eye movements. So we designed this task and uh, we designed several sentences and uh, we had uh, a sentence that was correct and the other one that was incorrect. And uh, you can see that here, for example, in the first sentence in Spanish, the feminine article la, uh, does not match with the masculine noun football uh, there. So this one was grammatically incongruent, whereas in the sentence below, the feminine article la matches with the feminine noun uh, beach, playa. So uh, if you remember what I told about eye tracking, respective that if participants were deafness were taking into consideration the grammatical cues, in this case, for example, the articles, they should uh, see something weird in the first sentence reflected in higher number of fixations and an increase in length of the fixations. Whereas in the second one, as it's correct, they shouldn't um, increase uh, this number of fixations in comparison to the previous one. So let's see what could happen. There you can see the circles are the fixations. So as you can see, more or less at the word football, the, uh, sorry, this is the second one, the, the participant uh, was paying a lot of attention, a lot of fixations there because they realized that something's weird here. Whereas if we compare this sentence with the second one, which is correct, they look at it, but uh, if we compare both, it's, it's, it's different. They, they make lower number of fixations and spend lower time there. So uh, we created sentences and asked participants to read these sentences and answer to one question, is the sentence correct? Um, so we had, uh, I'm going to talk about two of the predictions. One of the predictions was that if they uh, have a low grammatical level, of course they will obtain lower scores in this task. And the other one, which is related to eye movements, we expected that if they were not considering grammatical cues such as articles during their reading, we wouldn't observe this, this differential effect that looking more at the incongruent sentences than and the congruent ones. So as to the first prediction, we see it was supported but by our results because the students with deafness uh, obtain lower scores than students with typical activity. This demonstrates that they have lower skills uh, in terms of grammatical. And uh, uh, regarding eye movements, what we observe is that uh, contrary to our predictions, both typical, uh, students with typical hearing and students with deafness both increase their number of fixations and the time on the incongruent sentences than the congruent uh, uh, sentences. That is, this demonstrates that they are sensitive to grammatical violations. And moreover, we also have another interesting result that, that is that they uh, made more fixations on the, the participants with deafness tend to make more, much shorter fixations 
whereas the participants with typical hearing may, may less but longer fixation. And this is like a differential pattern between them. So bringing this to practice, because this is a quite exploratory study, uh, what can we say? Well, uh, we can say that it's not enough by, by saying the students, okay, be aware, here's an article, here's a preposition. We need to explicitly work with the grammatical markers uh, so that they can be trained in the proper use. So uh, another thing we need to train with them uh, are uh, the comprehension of complex sentences. And this is also published uh, in this reference. Uh, and uh, let's see uh, what it says. So uh, if I ask you now, did the world frighten the three little pigs? Maybe if I ask you this question, you think about the classic tale and you may answer, yes, the wolf did. He scared the, the three little pigs and of course he frightened them. But think that what if I say, okay, read the sentence, the wolf was frightened by the three little pigs. In this case, if you trust on your previous knowledge, your answer may be wrong. And it may be wrong also if you only trust on the information provided by content words. So in order to answer correctly to this question, you need to use the information especially provided by the preposition by and understand the syntactic structure of the sentence. So other authors suggest that related to this, they use a keyword strategy, students with deafness, which means that, for example, in an incomplete sentence like that, uh, the storm released A, the correct response would be catastrophe, but maybe because they focus on content words and fail with grammar, could say thunders, which it's not grammatically uh, correctly with, uh, with the sentence. But uh, also other authors suggest that the difficulty in students with deafness but this is when it's especially evident when they uh, are trying to process complex sentences. And moreover, other authors propose that students with deafness do not really uh, just use semantic cues, they use uh, grammatical cues, but inefficiently. So our aim was to look at this, and uh, the main difference was that in this case, we focus on sentences of varying syntactic complexity, not just simple sentences. We took this experimental task. In this case, we included semantically reversible sentences. That is, both the uh, both actors can take the role. For example, a wolf can uh, frighten a pig, uh, and the other way around. But a table, for example, cannot frighten because it's an inanimate uh, character. So, uh, in semantically reversible, both options are plausible, and uh, there were four types of sentences. Three of them were complex, whereas one was um, a simple sentence type, active sentences. And this is not a real item. This is just an example made up for this. So there you can see um, students visualize first with the sentence. For example, the lion was chased, was chased by the gazelle. And then they were asked to choose the, represent the, the picture that represented the sentence between four pictures. They had the target, which is number one, which represents the sentence. Then they had the syntactic structure, which is number four, which is the uh, representation of the sentence, but the rows are inverted. So if I don't take uh, uh, into account uh, grammatical markers, I might get confused by choosing this one. And then we have two pictures as lexical structure, which include an element that hasn't appeared on the sentence, and therefore students could choose it if they were not paying attention to the reading task or if they were in memory failed in that case. As to result, Nadina, uh, we're running out of time, and I would kindly suggest if you can go directly to the discussion, maybe for one minute. Yeah, yeah, I have just both on this. Perfect. Just, okay, yeah. So uh, we saw that the, the uh, they, they fail with complex sentences, but not with active sentences. Uh, and regarding eye movements, we observed that processing was similar, 
Uh, but of course, they got more confused with syntactic destructors. And if we go, if we look at the numbers numerically, they invested more, but uh, they uh, failed more with the task, and the processing with, with was similar. So uh, we need to train this. So the practical implications of this, what will be first? Uh, it's important to train even in secondary grade. Uh, complex uh, comprehension of complex grammatical structures in students with deafness. And also, it would be advisable to use semantically reversible sentence and, of course, use an appropriate feedback. For example, not just that the student this is correct or not, go beyond that and explain how uh, do they have to use the prepositions and uh, ask them to try to use it in the, in the example. These are the references, and this is everything. Thank you for your attention. Oh, so thank you so much, Nadina. You can open your camera now if you want. I'm sorry we don't have time for questions, but and I really, um, I really thank you for doing these uh, practical implications and how you can translate that. And that's, I think, something that you, you can see from both the studies and something that is really important that SLTs are, are doing. So, Nadina, just quick question, just like one phrase. Uh, what, why, what, why would you recommend an, an SLT, uh, an, a student now to you know, engage in a PhD? Well, I think that. Um, well, a speech therapy is a young uh, field, well, if we compare to other fields, and uh, we need um, efficacy in intervention. I think there's a lot to learn, and as I have heard before, uh, there's a lot of things we can do so they can start making a change. Mm -hmm. There's many things that are needed to be explored, and there are many techniques that are really uh, interesting. So. I think that uh, universities need uh, speech therapists to train a speech therapy in at university, and to, because of that, you need a PhD also. So yeah, that, that would be some of my recommendations okay. to get. It. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much, Nadina. I'm very sorry that uh, we didn't have more time to talk about your uh, magnificent and great results you had. We had a lot of food for, uh, for thoughts. And this is about the end of the workshop. And I want to thank all the speakers for the great presentations. And uh, so hopefully I enjoyed the summer and we still have some time uh, before holidays and for the other audience and people who might watch the the the, the workshop later in, a, in our YouTube channel. So uh, I, I hope this that was interesting. So have a great day. You too, thank you. Thank you.